Okay, folks. So as I, as I said last class, the first half of this session, or perhaps a little bit more, I want to talk about the Costco case, but I don't want you guys to freak out while I put numbers up. So you know, I, there will be numbers which I put up that are different from your numbers. It doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. But I want to divide the kinds of things we disagree on into three groups. There are things where you might have made a mistake or you've done something differently where the effects are minor here and minor everywhere. And I'm going to talk about those and I'm going to move on. Okay? Because it's, you know, in corporate finance and valuation, you've got to focus on the things that matter. And if it's a minor thing, that'll always be a minor thing, I'm going to let it go. There are things that might be minor in this case that could become major in some other investment analysis. And I want to talk about those simply because even if you've done it wrong on this case and it didn't make much of a difference, it could make a difference. And there are things that I think are major lessons that come out of the case that don't just apply to this case, but apply to all investment analysis and valuation. So I put the presentation together at 945. So any groups that had sent their cases in by 945 are included in the summaries you will see for what I saw. There were still cases coming in after 945, presumably until 1029. So I have 28 groups that I have the numbers for. That's why I asked for your numbers on the front page that I will show you what the numbers look like. You know, but if you're not in that 28, don't worry. As long as you turn it in by 1030, you'll still get graded fully, but it's just, uh, you know, you won't show up in the summary sheets. So here's the first thing I want to talk about. It's something we never really make explicit when we do corporate finance and valuation. We act as if time acts in discrete jumps. You know what I mean by that T1, T equal to two, that everything happens on December 31st of each year. The reality is things happen over the course of the year. So when I say year one, it's really across the year. Why do we do it? For convenience. And so when you look at t equal to zero, t equal, t equal to zero is not a year. It's a point in time. It's today. t equal to one is the end of the first year. t equal to two is the end of the second year. So we live in a continuous world, but, but we do things discreetly because it's convenient. And this sometimes trips people up. And this I classify in, under minor things that stay minor no matter what you do. So anybody have any ideas on what people do to take, you know, to counter the fact that things don't happen at the end of the year? What do you see used as a counter? or mid-year, a lot of people do things with what's called a mid-year convention. So rather than say your cash flows happen at the end of year one, end of year two, they say it's the end of half a year, one and a half years, two and a half years. They think they're making some amazing leap by doing this. But the truth is, if your project is a negative net present value project with end of the year cash flows and it becomes positive with middle of the year cash flows, my advice is don't take the project, right? If it's that. But also... In truth, it's not even the middle of the year, right? If you're a retailer, your cash flows are tilted towards the end of the year because October, November, December. So if you wanted to play this game, you could say it should be 0.6 of a year. But to me, it's kind of pointless because it doesn't make much of a difference. In fact, if you wanted to convert your net present value based on end of the year numbers into mid-year numbers, you know all you have to do is a very simple adjustment. Let's say you've computed NPV, you've done end of the year, you've got this pain in the neck boss who says, but why didn't you do things in the middle of the year? You don't have to do the whole thing again. There's, just, there's only one step you need to convert your NPV that you have into mid-year NPV. What do you have to do? Just take the NPV that you have, compound it for six months at your cost of capital. You got a middle of the year NPV. So if people want cash flows in the middle of the year, it's doable. But it's a confession. We do this all the time in valuation and corporate finance. The truth is the world moves in continuous time. So I'll summarize what I found. And this is where I want you to not start freaking out. Because my numbers are going to be different from yours. And your numbers are different from everybody else's in the class. There is no convergence here in a single number. So when I looked at this project, there were, you know, to, to look at the cash flows from the clinic specifically. I looked at healthcare companies and I built up to a beta based on healthcare companies. And the beta and the cost of capital I came up with 
the beta, we came up with the levered beta was 0.77, very close to the unlevered beta because Costco doesn't use much debt. It's about 2.5, 2.6% debt. My cost of capital is 8.23%. So I'll take you through the calculation. So that's for the clinic cash flows. The clinic does create side effects for the store, right? It loses cosmetic sales and it gains on sales from people being in the clinic. Those cash flows are not clinic cash flows. They're cash flows to retail. So I will talk about a retail cost of capital. Again, in this particular case, if you use the clinic cost of capital for those cash flows, it's not the end of the world. Those are small enough that they don't make a difference, but it's something to think about when you have projects that create cash flows in two places. Yeah. That doesn't matter, right? Because those cash flows still come from the store. Those cash flows are still a function of the retail business you run. So if you hadn't run this, those cash flows would have come in at the retail risk, right? So what you've displaced are re So let's suppose the clinic, the cosmetic cash flows were a guaranteed cash flow. The government walked in every day and bought all of your cosmetics and you bring in the clinic, you've lost a guaranteed cash flow, right? So when I ask you what the present value of those cash flows is, you're going to take those cash flows, discount them back at the risk-free rate saying those cash flows would have been guaranteed and now you replace them with these clinic cash flows that are riskier. So even though the clinic is displacing cosmetics, the risk of the cosmetics still comes from the core business you're in. Again, in this case, I'm not taking off any points for you not doing this. Just be aware that if you have two different cash flows in two different businesses, some of you did it took a third tactic. Instead of using either the, co the clinic cost of capital or the retail cost of capital, what could you do because you're getting cash flows from both? You could take a weighted average. So some of you did take a weighted average and it it's it's heavily weighted to the clinic cash flows. That's perfectly okay. Remember the weights will change over time. So it's a bit of a pain in the neck to do. No, so that's why I think when you have two sets of cash flows, it's better to keep them separate. Again, not a not a deal breaker here. The net present uh, from an, uh, I computed the accounting return. I'll tell you what I rushed through the accounting return, and some of you did get stuck on the accounting returns. I got a bunch of emails. Oh, should I allocate this? What about? Th and my answer is, if you're ultimately the decision maker, right? If you're not going to base your decision on the accounting return, what's the point of finessing the accounting return? So I did do an accounting return. I can't, I'm sorry, question? Yeah. No, no, but to get to a cost of capital, you need a cost of equity, right? It's an intermediate, a return in equity. You don't need to do a return in equity, yeah. Um, so, but you can do a return on equity for any firm. You don't, with a traditional non-financial service firm, it's better to stay focused on return on invested capital because the equity number is a volatile number. In this case, again, not a big deal. Why? Because they use so little debt, but it's non-financial firm, better to stay focused on return on capital and cost of capital. Yeah. Yes. The side cost is $2 million per store. The side benefit is much bigger in terms of revenues. But what are your cash flows from those revenues? you got to first multiply by an operating margin. Your operating margin is tiny in Costco. It's 3.6%. You used to grow gross margin, you're going to get a higher number. Again, those are the things I will let it slip because words matter right? Margins, operating versus gross margin are very different numbers. For a long time in Tesla, people would say, the gross margin is positive. Hip -hip hooray. What am I going to do with gross margins? It's gross income. I've got all this stuff below me. So the 3.6% low gross margins means that even though people are buying a lot of stuff, that Costco chicken at $4.99, how much money do you think Costco makes on it? It's a, it's a loss leader. So if all these people just walk into the store and buy your loss leaders and sample all your food and then leave with one item, you're 
kind of not going to make much money. So it's a low margin business. So in this case, you know, I, uh, so I, I let me go to the, the cut to the chase. I computed the net present value because that's what my decision was going to be based on. The net present value that I got with the finite life was 15, 15 years was 3.3 billion. Before considering the side costs, and I, I kept the two separate. With the side costs and side benefits, it's really 2.5 billion. So the number you should compare to is the 2.5 billion rather than the 3.3 because it incorporates the side costs and the side benefits. With the longer life, I mean, I might have messed up, but did it say in the case that the longer life had to be a perpetuity? It doesn't have to be. It could be 50 more years. Two groups actually did not use a perpetuity assumption. Most of you did, and I'm going to as well. But remember, a perpetuity assumption is not always the default. You can say, I'm going to extend it 50 more years. It requires different assumptions. With the perpetuity, my net present value was $8.7 billion before side costs and about $6.8 billion. That difference between what I got with my finite life and my longer life. I want you to keep your eye on that and think about what the difference you came up with was. My difference is about 4.3 billion. We'll talk about why for some of you that difference was as high as 35 billion. And I think the lowest number that a group had is the difference was 343 million, almost the same net present value. We'll talk about what causes that difference. What is That has huge implications for how we think about terminal value, not just in projects, but in valuation. The side costs exceeded the side benefits, at least in my case, because side benefits were low because of those low margins. I did recommend accepting the project because at least for me, the net present values were positive on both. At least 10 of the groups had negative net present value with the finite life case and positive net present values with the longer life. And we'll talk about what choices they made because that's a tougher choice. For me, the choice was relatively simple. On the accounting return, my first go around, I got about four to seven percent. Not great, in fact, because of the, especially because my operating income was pushed down by that huge allocated GNA. You take that allocated GNA out, the return capital jumps to about twenty-five percent. You're saying which one's the right one? I'm not using either, but I think the twenty-five percent is probably closer to the truth than the four to seven percent because the allocation is going to be there no matter what. So let me start with my cost of capital calculation. There are two two things at play here. One is the clinic, which is a healthcare business. Yes, go ahead, Gandhar. If my net present value had been mildly negative, and I, in my case, it doesn't. I'm accepting the project anyway. This is icing on the cake if I get subscription. You know what, what, what I mean by the subscription growth, right? Which is a part of Costco's revenues come from people pay. I think the subscription now, annual subscription is $69, $79, whatever it is. So those subscribers pay $79 a year. Adding the clinics might actually increase their subscribers. And here's why. Let's suppose you hear that Costco clinics are a great deal, much better than going walking to CVS or into an urgent healthcare, but you're not a subscriber. You might not have been interested in that $4.99 chicken. But if you can get a healthcare visit for $20, $20 rather than $40, you might say, look, I'm going to start a Costco subscription. Three visits kind of covers my subscription fee. So added subscribers, which we haven't built into the cash flows, are potentially something that can increase the value of this project. And I'm saying that there's potential for added value for the retail business or for the it doesn't matter, right? It's an optionality for Costco as a company. Ultimately, all the money comes from Costco. It goes to Costco, right? We're not even talking about what discount rate to apply to that subscription revenues. We're just treating it as added revenues. So basically, it is revenues that Costco will get. It, it, we'll talk a little bit about optionality in the next class. There's an optionality in this project. What is optionality? There are things you might be able to do if this project succeeds that you haven't factored into the analysis. And the added subscribers you can think of as optionality here, which makes the project more attractive than just the net present value would lead you to think. 
ultimately it will, but I, right now I don't know enough to, to do it. Basically, I'm, so this is something I can see happening, but since I've not built into, the, built into the cash flows, all I have is a net present value based on what I've observed. It's the same argument you could use. We value Tesla and you say, what if full, you know, FSD catches on and Tesla becomes a ride-sharing company? You might decide right now that's not going to happen, but that doesn't mean it'll never happen. Optionality reflects the chances you could go into new businesses if this project succeeds. So let's talk about the cost of capital. Again, I gave you the healthcare companies, very you know diverse mix. Some of you pruned that sample perfectly okay. But remember, when you prune samples, your sample size gets smaller. One of the reasons we use bottom-up betas is, is the law of large numbers. So you've got to be careful you don't prune the sample too much. So I computed the unlevered beta for those healthcare companies and then applied cost goes there. You know, so the unlevered beta came up with this 0.75, cleaning up for cash. I applied cost goes debt to equity ratio, which is very low. The debt comes from two places. One is traditional interest bearing debt, where I gave you enough information to convert book debt to market debt. Again, this is one of those things we decided not to do, not a big deal here and in many projects, but to me, it keeps things consistent. Everything is in market value terms and the other is the lease commitments. On the lease commitments, there's one thing I noticed as I was browsing through the cases. Some of you had a present value of lease commitments exactly $425 million, or so roughly that much higher than mine. You know where the $425 million comes from? That's most last year. I mean, again, this is not, on this case, don't freak out if you included it. When we talk about the most recent year, it's done. Remember that came out of the 2023 annual report. It's done. That money's been spent. You can't count it as part of your lease debt now because you've already paid it. It's already done. So generally speaking, not just here, but everywhere else, when you think about the most recent year, that earnings, that cash flow is pretty much in the past. You cannot bring into the analysis now. So my lease debt is based on future commitments, the present value of those commitments at what discount rate? What do you discount the lease commitments at? The pre-tax cost of debt rather than the after-tax cost of debt. And again, I noticed a couple of groups use after-tax. Again, no, this is not the, play, the hill I want to die on or you should die on, but you should use the pre-tax cost of debt because the lease commitments are pre-tax commitments. Low debt ratio feeds into my debt to equity and debt to capital ratio. My levered beta for the Costco clinics is 0.77, which gives me a cost of equity for Costco clinics of 8.34%. In parallel, I also told you the regression beta. You know, I asked you to use the regression beta, otherwise I'd have to create another samples of retail companies and I want to torture you a second time to do a bottom-up beta. I said, just take the regression beta. Assume that's a reasonable beta to use for Costco retail. That gives me a cost of equity for Costco retail of 9.51%. So the cost of capital for the two businesses are different. So the clinic business is going to be a safer business in terms of cash flows and cost of capital than the retail business. So you've got these two costs of capital going. I'm going to keep the two costs of capital on their own channels. As I said, some of you took a weighted average of these numbers reflecting how much Perfectly okay, on a, on a, or at least on a, on a theoretical level. Practically, you'll run into issues with the weights changing. So here's what, yes, go ahead, Manish. Slide, uh, equity risk means something in the bond. Why don't we take 50 stores in the U.S. and make it make 10? They were near one stores. So, but why would you not count them? Because those clinics are going to be in those. Oh, you're saying why they're not counted here? Uh, you could. I mean, you'd, you'd get you'd get a, a lower cost of capital. I kind of let uh, you know based it only on the new stores. No. So here are the costs of capital. You will you know you told me you used in your case. So this came out of the summary, the first page where you summarized your cost of capital. There was one group of the cost of capital less than seven. I mean. If you look at the, the distribution of cost of capital, you can see a lot of cost of capital are bunched up between seven and a half and eight and a half percent, which you would expect, right? Diff you know, the 425 million to be counted as debt, you know, slightly different assumptions about how you unlevered the beta, because you could take the same sample. I noticed one group used a weighted average to come up with the unlevered beta. I'm okay with it statistically, but don't do it. And here's why. 
when you use a weighted average, you lose the power of the law of large numbers. I'll give you an example. If I did a weighted average beta for software companies, you know what I'll be ending up using as my beta for every software company? I'll be using Microsoft's beta, right? Market cap is so big. So weighted averages kind of give away what you gain by using bottom-up betas. So even though in this case, I you know it's, it, it, I let it fly, don't do weighted averages when you do bottom-up betas. Just stick with simple averages because you want the law of large numbers. If you feel that some of the companies, because they're really big, don't belong, just take them out, right? Or really small, don't belong, take them out, but don't do weighted averages. So those are your cost of capital. There were cost of capital above nine and a half percent. The below 7% and above 9.5%, I am going to take a closer look at your cost of capital if you show me the calculations because there's something there that I don't get. You know, Given what I see, maybe use book debt ratios to come up with the cost of capital, which will give you a lower cost of capital. Yeah, Maybe you lever the beta using a much higher debt to equity ratio, which gave you a higher cost of capital. But I'd expect cost of capital to be between 75 and 8.5%, and which is what most of you got. Justin? Always when you do a bottom-up beta on your own. Yeah. As I said, with the return on capital, I did not spend way too much time on this, but I took my operating income. I divided by the invested capital. And your choices on what to include in invested capital and what to leave in your operating income have a big impact on your return capital. For the most part, you find really low returns on capital on this project. Why? Because that allocated GNA was such a killer pushing down your operating income that your operating income that you had as your estimate gave you return capital. And I got the same result, return capital of about, you know, in this case, 7%. You know, if, if I don't include the side cost, most net, net and 4%. But if I took the allocated GNA out, that return capital jumped to 25%. So if I were using accounting return on capital for my decision, this would become a big deal. Should I be doing this based on incremental operating income or the accountant's estimate? And it's really a red flag when you see companies basing decisions on return on capital. It's a question to ask about, hey, is this being caused by allocations rather than what this project is doing? So your returns on capital, you can see lo lots of groups had returns on capital less than 7.5%. There were a few groups with much higher returns on capital. My guess is it's coming from choices made on what to leave in invested capital and how you compute your operating income. Any questions on the return capital? Yes. I will, I will send it out because I put it together just before the class and get a chance to put it online, but I will do it right after the class. So trust me, there's no secrets I'm going to hold back here. Yes, Justin. Invested capital. There's, projects don't have cash. So remember, projects, if it's a company, cash is an issue. Projects don't carry cash. If you have cash in a project, it goes to the company. So it's always going to be based on CapEx. So it's not a balance sheet based invested capital, which you get for companies by taking debt plus equity minus cash. This is really CapEx minus depreciation building up over time. That's your invested capital. Yes. A moment ago, you said it might just be a matter of allocation. But what, what do you mean by that? Like allocation? Well, like the GNA, right? The allocated GNA was some accountant sitting in where, I don't know, where Costco's headquarters are saying, look, we have a lot of GNA. This project looks good. Let me allocate, right? It's, it's, it's in a sense, the question to ask is if you reject this project based on return on capital you've actually rejected a good project because that GNA is still there. It's going to go to some other project. So allocation decisions make a big deal with accounting. Okay? In a minute, I'm going to talk about the expansion investment they have to make. If you're an accountant, when you make an expansion investment, guess what you do? You allocate. Because that's how accountants think. Let me take 40% of the investment, put it in this project. But the question is, why 40? Why not 20? Why not 60? Right. So when you're doing accounting, allocations are by definition going to be I'm not going to use the word arbitrary. They're going to be subjective. And that subjective judgment can make the difference between accepting and rejecting a project. Justin? These are the averages over the 15 years. Now, in fact, you can see why you have to pick an average, right? In fact, there was there were two groups that, that emailed me yesterday saying, should I, do you want returns on capital every year for the next 15 years? Or do you want an average? I said, I don't want anything. You are the one making the decision based on this. 
would you be able to make a decision with 15 different numbers? And the answer is, you know, you're going to accept it in year 15, but not in year three. This is not something you can do. So you're almost forced into averaging. And there again, there can be differences in how you average. You can take a simple average. I actually computed an aggregated return on capital. I added up the operating income over the 15 years, added up the invested capital over the 15 years. Because then you don't get these very high numbers at the tail end of your distribution kind of pushing up the average. So let's say the finite life case. The part that I think one one tricky part here, not in terms of numbers, but in terms of uh, in terms of what it does, is by taking this investment, you run out of this logistic system capacity earlier rather than later. Key is earlier rather than later. Okay. It turns out you got to spend the money on a new system in year four instead of year eleven. I'll tell you, show you how I got the year four and eleven from from a you know, from an accounting perspective, this might create headaches, but from a cash flow perspective, the effect is very simple. It's a difference in present values between investing in year four and investing in year 11. So I'll show you where I got the year four and 11. Basically, I computed the capacity that Costco retail would have used without the clinic. Remember, the key to incremental is what will happen if I take the project? What will happen if I don't take the project? If I don't take the project, I'll run out of capacity in year 11. If I take the project, I'll run out of capacity in year four. Well, if I invest in year four because I take this project, that's a cash outflow. But by doing it, what have I saved? I don't have to invest in year 11. You got to bring the other half of the equation. If you just show the investment in year four and don't show the savings in year 11, it's a little unfair to this project, right? Because in a sense, you're counting the bad stuff, but you're not counting the good stuff. So net present value effect is, in fact, if you wanted to really finesse this, there'll be additional depreciation you get because you invest early, you can bring that in. But starting in year 11, that depreciation will actually the, will turn against you because you'd have invested at a much higher value in year 13. So again, it's not a make it or break it here, but if you have something that you're using that you'll run out of capacity earlier, you got to factor in the time value. So here's what my numbers look like. Yeah. My guess is your revenue numbers and cost of goods sold numbers are going to be pretty, uh, are going to be almost exactly mine or very similar to mine. But then after that, you're going to get deviations first in how you compute a depreciation, the GN. So this is a full calculation of the operating income. And then I'm fixing it. I'm adding back the depreciation. I'm adding back the portion of the GNA that I should not have subtracted up. So that's that allocated portion. I've left just the incremental portion. My free cash flows of firm are negative until year four, turn positive in year five, and then build up over time. Year 15, because I'm running this project to end it in year 15, I stop the project, I salvage. I assume the salvage value will be equal to the book value of the assets. Why do I do that? Let's say you assume that salvage value is different from book value. You assume, let's say you put in salvage value of zero. You forgot salvage value entirely. But post case submission, you decide to come up with a rationalization. You say, we thought about this and we decided that the clinic assets will be worth nothing. So put a salvage value of zero. That's plausible, right? But if that is your story, what do you have to do to complete the story? If you liquidate for less or more than book value, what does it create? It creates either a capital loss or a capital gain. So if you tell me the salvage value is zero, I'm okay with that. As long as you've shown me the tax savings you're going to get because you liquidated at zero. Now do you see why the convenient assumption is to set salvage value equal to book value? You eliminate, there's no taxes involved. Basically I've removed that from the equation. So that's my book value of assets at the end of year 50. Now, of course, I could have done this incremental cash flow much more directly by using just the incremental GNA, right? Because it's a pain in the neck to subtract out the total GNA and add it back to kind of clean up for it. I get exactly the same cash flow if you want to can compare. My advice to you, not just for this case, but for the project, is if you have to do cash flows on a project and there's allocated stuff and incremental stuff, and the question is about incremental cash flows, it might be easier to just go directly with the incremental step rather than doing a full-fledged operating income and cleaning up 
for the things you should not have put into the IRA. You don't have that choice if you have if you're asked for earnings, if you're asked for cash flows, just an incremental cash flow. So here's my finite life net present value. In, with uh, so basically, I have my cash flows. I discount them back at the cost of capital for Costco clinics. So that's the eight point two three percent. I've got the side costs and benefits, which are to retailing. I discount them back at a cost of capital for Costco retail, which is higher. The advantage of keeping them separate is you don't have to compute weighted averages. It takes care of itself. So whenever you have two streams of cash flows, which have very different risk characteristics, rather than bundle them together and take a weighted average, value the two separately. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose you value Palantir. And 40% of the cash flows are from the government and they're guaranteed. 60% of the other businesses and their traditional software data risk involved. To value Palantir, it might actually be better to take the 40% that's government cash flows, discount them back at close to a risk-free rate if they're guaranteed, and take the remaining 60% and value them as traditional software businesses with a higher cost of capital and then add them up. The advantage of NPVs, you can always add them up at the end and it'll work. Okay. So my, I looked at your NPVs and you can see 10 of the groups, 10 of the tw I had 28 groups that submitted, 10 had negative NPVs in the finite life case. I'll tell you where, where those negative net present values can come from. One is if you used a higher cost of capital, you're more likely to find a negative NPV. The second is if you put in an investment of 1.1 billion in year four, but didn't have a counter in year 13, that is going to tilt you towards a negative NPV because you punish them with the negative, but you're not offsetting with partial positives. Okay? It could also be because when you did the working capital, you did the total working capital rather than the change in working capital. Remember the, the effect on your cash flows comes from change. So if you've got a huge negative NPV, my guess is you're, counting and double counting and triple counting the same working capital over and over again. Yes. Yeah. I don't get that, but are oh, you, are you right in the, in year 12? That's fine. No, no. So you had two investments and then did you have a saving? So, okay, okay, that's fine, yeah, yeah. So the net present value that I get put together was 2.5 billion. That includes the NPV from the Costco clinic and the offsetting effect of losing sales at the store. Any questions of the finite life case? So key, qu key issues are check your working capital calculations. Again, it's not about the case to make sure you recognize the change in working capital. And one of the things you will see about the working capital cash flows is they start a year earlier than my revenues do. Why is that? What is it in the case that leads me to do that? And at the start of each year, basically it means at the end. Of, again, if you showed it in the same year, the effect on net present value is minor, but keep that in mind. Start of the year and the end of the year are very different from a time value perspective. Let's talk about extending the life. Now, when you sit down with the project, you get to the end of year 15 and I said, do you want to keep the project going longer? And of course you're going to say yes. Because if it's all gravy, it looks like it always adds to value. But it's a trade-off, right? If you want to run your project, your clinics to last forever, you got to, you know, you got to behave very differently right from the beginning. What does that mean? No, when when you looked at the finite life case, you noticed that I had no capital maintenance. That might be extreme. You might, some of you might have put in some capital maintenance because even with a 15-year life, but I've gone with that extreme, no capital maintenance. Why? Because in my mind, I'm saying, look, I'm going to shut this down after year 15. My clinics are going to look worse and worse over time. But by the end of year 15, I'm going to shut them down anyway. In contrast, when I run this project for a longer life, right from the start, I've got to be thinking about how do I keep these clinics looking good essentially forever? This is a long lead into the fact that you can have no capital maintenance in the 15-year life, but you cannot get away with that if you decide to run the project for a longer time. Okay. So basically, in the, in, the, in, the, in the longer life case, 
I take the depreciation. And the reason the depreciation is a good starting point, if you think about depreciation, it's accounting, but if you think of it as economic depreciation, basically it's a loss in value in your clinics on a year-to-year -year basis. I want to at least bring that back in to keep the clinics okay. The only problem, though, is there's inflation kind of playing a role here. So if my depreciation is two, is 40 million from something I invested 10 years ago, to replace that is going to cost me more than 40 million. So again, it's a little detail that might or might not make an overall difference, but something to think about in terms of capital maintenance. So because one of the things is there's nothing in the case about capital maintenance. And you say, well, you told us nothing. I don't have to, right? It's your assumptions about longer life that are leading to it. Depreciation is as good a place as any to start in capital maintenance. So what you're going to see is capital maintenance kicking in every year, and it builds up over time. And especially when you get to year 16. You're saying, why do I need to go to year 16? I, you know, I just need a terminal value at the end of year 15. Remember, to get the terminal value in year 15, I need to do an extra year because things can be different in year 16. My capex is set above my depreciation. Actually, the, this is wrong. It should be it's set at eight. I think 866 million. Why do I need to do that? Why does capex have to exceed depreciation once you get to year 16, or at least be equal to depreciation? What are you depreciating? It's whatever you invested, right? So if, you cap, if your depreciation is higher than your capex going forward, passing, in fact, this is right through year 15. In year 16, I set the capex above depreciation. I could have set it equal to depreciation, but I've set it slightly above because of the inflation effect. Because if I don't do that, I will have nothing left to depreciate. Remember, this is forever. This is a true, not just in projects. I see it in discounted cash flow valuations of companies all the time, where depreciation exceeds capex forever. This is impossible. You cannot do it. It's not feasible. So in this case, at least to get to year 16, I bring in CapEx to cover the depreciation. My terminal value reflects the fact that I've now invested enough to keep this project going forever. So one way to think about finite versus per, per, uh, longer life is to think about the trade-off. Yes. You go, you're going to get there anyway, right? So then you're doing it 110% all the way through. So I've just set it above inflation once I get there because it turns out that there's a, there's, there's a problem with capital maintenance because when you put in capital maintenance, it creates more depreciation. So if you're not careful, your spreadsheets can start to spin out of control. So you can't just make 110% of depreciation and include capital maintenance in it because the number will just keep getting bigger and bigger and you'll be kind of chasing the depreciation number, which will keep getting bigger with each iteration. So that's why I had to separate the two. So here's what the trade-off looks like. Yes. Yes. You can make all, I mean, it's completely okay. So if you have a separate depreciation schedule for the maintenance, at least, I mean, basically what I want to see is, are you thinking about the need for more capital maintenance in the longer life? That's the only question. So if you put in capital maintenance and it's different from mine, I'm still going to let it go saying, look, you said it at 80% of depreciation or you said it based on something else. At least you're thinking about differentiating between the two scenarios. That really is the key. What I'm looking for is to make sure that your capital maintenance is not the same in both scenarios. That is a problem because then you're treating your finite life and your longer life as essentially equivalent in terms of what you'll have to put back into the story. So my net present value reflects these assumptions, higher capital maintenance, a bigger terminal value. And in fact, one way to think about finite versus the, inf the longer life case is you're trading off. You're trading off lower cash flows for the next 15 years because you have the capital maintenance for that much higher terminal value. In this particular project, extending the life, increase the net present value. Can you see why this trade-off can work against you on other projects where extending the life can actually make your net present value smaller? If what you have to spend to keep this project going in the first 15 years that exceeded what you got as a difference in terminal value, so it's not always true that lengthening the life of a project will increase net present value. In this case, it did. But there's a lot of lots of reasons why most projects are finite life projects. 
because extending the life is always better. Every project would become a perpetual project, and that doesn't happen in the real world. So my net present values here are higher, 8.65 billion when I extend the life out because a higher terminal value. My overall NPV with the side cost considered is 6.8 billion. So I looked at your longer life NPVs. There were three groups that had negative NPVs even with the longer lives. Their decision was a slam dunk. They were rejecting, right? But there were 25 groups, so which means there are seven groups that had negative NPV in the finite life, but positive NPV. Six of those seven chose to accept the project, or maybe five of the seven chose to accept the project. The other two said, we're still going to stay. And that's perfectly okay. It's your decision to make. And you're saying, look, it's too risky to base it on assuming the project will continue forever. No. But there were NPVs out there. I think the highest NPV was 44 45 billion, which means that your terminal value is just running away from you. Something in your terminal value is kind of causing the NPV to explode. And that's a good thing to actually check to see how different the numbers are because it'll tell you, is there an assumption in my terminal value that I need to revisit because that difference can be large. In fact, I took the difference that you showed me in your net present values. My net present values are different by about four to five billion. There were NPVs which were different by 30, 35, 40 billion. And when you get that much of a difference, it's worth checking your terminal value assumptions to see what's causing the difference. It's kind of a sanity check. The lowest number was actually 340 million. You're not present. That group assumed a 50 year life after year 10 and actually made a fresh investment at the end. I'm sorry, at the end of year 15, they made a fresh investment of two billion. In, in other words, they almost renew. So rather than have capital maintenance, they actually did it almost like a, a renewable project where they did it three times. And that's why their numbers were much closer is because of those assumptions. So as a general, and this is not, not just on this case, you know, you're going to be doing terminal value calculations in finance all the time. You'd see it in discounted cash flow valuations, you're doing projects. You know. If you have a project that's finite, you're your capital maintenance can be low, you have salvage value. If you have infinite life and you set the growth to zero, remember your nominal growth is zero, your project is actually shrinking in real terms, right? With an inflation rate of 3%, then you can set capital maintenance equal to depreciation yeah? because you're assuming zero growth. If you assume growth is equal to inflation, your capex, at least in an inflationary world, has to be higher than your depreciation. Now we can debate how much higher. And if you set your growth rate at number greater than 3%, I haven't checked any of your group reports carefully enough, but if you set your growth rate about 3%, you got a capacity problem, right? Because then you're adding clinics to stores that don't have them yet, which means there's a fresh round of CapEx. That's not maintenance CapEx, new CapEx that you've got to come in. Okay, not a problem. I'm okay with that. But then you got to show that new CapEx. So, you tell me your assumptions in the longer life. I'm going to check to make sure that you are assuming something that is consistent with those assumptions in terms of capital maintenance and new capex. Okay. So of the 28 groups, 20 chose to invest, six suggested rejection. There were two groups that gave a conditional acceptance, you know, which is which you have to be careful about, right? Because you either accept or not. The conditional acceptance was the project doesn't look good on a 15 year basis. It looks okay if you have a perpetual life. So if you think the life will be perpetual, you should accept the project. But remember, it's not what you think. It's whether you want to make, it, it's, a, it's a choice you will make. As a, so if Costco decides to go with the project, it's not sitting there till the end of the 15th year, tossing a coin saying, do we continue? Do we not continue? It's not a probabilistic choice. It's a choice that you will make and run the store, the clinics very differently. So when you make conditional acceptances, they might not really work. So I'm going to treat them as accept, even though you said conditionally accept, because you really can't conditionally accept a project, either accept or you reject. There was one group, though, that had positive net present values, both the finite and the perpetual life that said reject. I haven't read the report, you know, and I would like to see what the rationale is. I mean, I can, I can think of potential explanations, 
but I was I was interested to see if there are any groups that got a negative NPV that said except because of the optionality. Again, I haven't read the reports carefully enough, but that's basically what you're looking for. Any questions on, on that? So here's what's going to happen. And I, I have my undergraduate quizzes this afternoon, so I will get to 300 quizzes. I've got to get those graded by tonight. Once I'm done with that tomorrow, I will turn to the cases and I will send you a grading template so you can see with 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 letter codes, what the letter codes will see. There are 10 basic things I'm looking for in there. So your your case will come back saying 3A, 5B. And you say, what the heck is that? Go to the grading template and say 3A is your working cap, you know, your cost of capital is based on the regression beta for the clinic and you should have used. So basically with each mistake, I will identify what it is. And I will, so when you, you know, hopefully you, you CC'd everybody in your group when you sent me the case because I'm going to reply all. So you will all get that graded case back at the same time. So it'll it'll come in it's first in, first out. So whichever cases came in first are going to go out first. So tomorrow at some time during the day, check your email because you will be seeing the case. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, uh, both the uh, the file, the Excel file and the PowerPoint presentation are going to be linked up after class today, so you can download both. Okay. Don't worry, it's not that bad. Uh, it's as I said, this is. I mean. This isn't about really the case. What I want you to do is take what's in the case and think about how it plays out when you do financial analysis, when you do valuation, because what you see here is a microcosm and the kinds of issues you run into any time you do a discounted cash flow valuation. Yes, Kanta. Sorry, if I may just in the finite life stage, yeah. you would get your for logic. Yeah. Fully depreciated by the end of but the fact that something depreciates doesn't mean it's not usable, right? This is the difference between account, as long as capacity is there. The reason to reinvest is not because it depreciated, but because I need a new capacity. I ran out of capacity. That's a good reason to invest. Depreciating something down, there are lots of companies out there whose assets have been depreciated down to zero. The factories, factories are completely functional, right? Yeah, because it's accounting depreciation. It's not economic. If accounting and economic depreciation were identical, when something reaches a value, book value of zero, it'll be useless, right? So in the real world, the two diverge. So if you're going to reinvest. It has to be because you ran out of capacity again, rather than the only reason I'd bring in the year 12 is then this creates a cycle by doing it in year. So this is a continuing present value effect rather than, you know, so... What I've done in this 15 year life, you can think of replic because I've in a sense replicated that when I do the perpetuity, I'm essentially doing this over and over again for the rest of time, investing five or six years earlier. So that's what you want to bring in is that earlier versus later. And that's why I did not do the year 13 because I thought about it and said, I don't want to go there because it's going to create a mess in terms of cleaning up at the end of year 15. So last session, we were talking about the different decision rules. And one of the nice things about actually getting your hands dirty, looking at a project, computing cash flows, computing accounting return, is you get to see the underbelly of each of these approaches because they all look great in, on paper, right? But then when you compute return capital, you realize how much allocation can affect it. When you compute cash flows, you realize the difference between incremental and total cash flows. And then you also realize that $3 billion in net present value looks good, but uh, what's the market cap of Costco as a company? $600 billion plus, right? So if you think about it, this is a project that even if it succeeds, at best case, is going to create about 5% or 6% increase in value. So... From that, from that perspective, you know, you, you might say, well, do I want to go with a high net present value or should I be looking at internal rates of return? Incidentally, the IRRs, and I computed them, at least for the finite life case, about 16 to 
Now, remember, the choice there depends on, do you think Costco faces a capital rationing constraint? And you might come down on the fact that it doesn't. It's a big company. It can raise capital. But at this point, you have the ammunition to tell me, given the different decision rules, which one. So let's say you're the CFO of a company or you're, the, you're the, the owner of the company and you're trying to pick a decision rule that everyone in your company will now follow, decide on projects. And I'll give you the choice. You can go with accounting returns. Half of all companies around the world, you know, especially if you go outside the US, use accounting returns to pick projects. You can stay with that. You can go with payback, which just looks at the number of years it takes you to get your money back. Very simplistic, but very easy to understand. Net present value, IRR, or the profitability index, where you took the net present value and scaled it to the investment. So I'm not looking for a right answer. I want you to think with your gut, because this is a choice that every company has to make when it thinks about how do we decide on projects. So I'll show you what the, what the statistics look like across companies. So this is from a survey of US companies, large and small. And basically it looks at the percent, and, and it gives you the di difference between you know, what the numbers look like in 2022 and the number in 2001. So basically, if you look at large companies, okay, in 2001, more of those companies used NPV than they do now. So in fact, there's been a shift away from NPV and IRR across both small and large companies. Towards what? You see, actually, move back towards accounting returns. So much as we dump on accounting returns, people seem to be going back to accounting returns, at least for segments. And I, you know, and especially this return in invested capital. And one reason for that is for whatever reason, consulting firms have become enamored with this idea of return invested capital. It's such a great concept that they're pushing it on companies and they're tying compensation contracts. And you can already see the dangers of accounting return-based investment analysis have just become worse over the last 20 years rather than better. It used to be, as I taught this class from 1986 through 2002, the movement was towards time value weighted incremental returns, it seemed to be. And over the last 20 years, we've seen actually, you know, migration away from that back to accounting returns, at least in some of these companies. So return invested capital in particular. So that's the different ways of looking at a project. Let's kind of talk about side costs and side benefits. They became an issue in the case, but let's face it, any large company taking a project creates side costs and side benefits for it. And let's take a Disney movie, right? A new Disney Avengers movie. There's the movie revenues and cash flows. Does it create side, side costs for Disney as a company? What are the potential side costs when you have a big Avengers movie? more of the time of management might be spent on that movie than on other things as a side cost because you have only a certain number of people, resources get allocated there. There could be side costs for your marketing department, advertising department that are not captured as real costs. Are they side benefits? Yeah. If you've gone to Disneyland, they now have an event, a section which is, you know, I don't know what, the, what, what it's called, but it, basically it's the Avengers part of Disneyland. The theme parks benefit. They have a streaming network. If Avengers movies do well, my guess is Avengers shows on Disney Plus will do better. Side costs and side benefits, which are not, basically these are not in your cash flows. And the question is, how do you bring them in? So let's look at a few examples of side costs and side benefits. Let's say you're a company which, has, I mean, you're an established company, you have assets, you have resources, you look at a new project. You almost never start that project from scratch. What does that mean? You don't invest from zero for that project. You don't hire new people for the project. You often take existing people in the company and you assign them to the project. You might take resources you already own and use them in the project. And at first sight, that looks like a freebie, right? I already have these employees. I already own this resource. All I'm doing is using something that's not being fully utilized but there is an opportunity cost and you have to make it explicit. Let's think about the opportunity cost. The first is you could take that resource and sell it. So if Disney has an extra building in Burbank that's empty that they're going to use for the next project they take. That might seem free, but until you think about the fact that Burbank is a pretty expensive 
you know, real estate section of LA that if you sold that building, so that is an opportunity cost by using this, by taking this project, you could not sell it. Even if you don't sell the asset, maybe you can lease or rent the asset and earn income if you don't take the project. Or the third is the most messy, which is if you don't, if you use it up on this project, you might not be able to use it on another project that comes around three or four years from now. So you could sell, you can rent or lease. You have to think about future uses for this. So let's take an example. Let's assume that that Rio Disney theme park is using land that Disney acquired several years ago. When it bought the land, the land cost only $5 million. So the book value of the land is $5 million. File that away because that's what they originally paid for the land. That's what you're going to see on the balance sheet. That land today, if it were sold, would get you $40 million. But there's a catch. If you sold it, there would be capital gains. You'd have to pay a 20% tax on the capital gains. So let's say you go back to the Rio Disney and you forgot this when you did the original Rio Disney. And you're trying to bring in the opportunity cost of this land. Let me give you the choices. The first is you can ignore the cost of the land. Say we own it already, which a lot of companies do. The second is you can listen to your accountants who say, use the book value, the 5 million as your opportunity cost. The third is you can use the market value of the land, which is what you can get if you sold the land today. That sounds closer to the truth, right? But if I sell the land, though, I've got to close the loop. If I sell the land, what's the next step? I've got to pay taxes. How much should I pay in taxes? Not 8 million. Remember, taxes are based on capital gains. It'll be 35 million in capital gains, 40 minus five, it'll be 7 million. 40 million minus 7 million would become 33 million. You'll show it as part of your initial investment for Rio Disney because you're using a resource that you could get money. You see how messy this is going to get, right? You take a big company on a big project, think of how many resources they borrow from other parts of the company. I'm forcing you to put a number because if I did not, You'd be acting like these resources were free and taking projects you should not be taking. So let's take a second example of an incremental cost. Okay? Let's assume Bookscape, that in the privately owned bookstore, is thinking about starting an online retail venture. It's going to cost them a million dollars up front, a capital expenditure of a million dollars to get this going. These investments are expected to have a life of four years. So let's keep this simple. At the end of four years, you're going to salvage it, get nothing back. And over those four years, here's what you will see. You're going to see the revenues from the online retailing be a million and a half, growing 20% a year into your two and 10%. So basically, you're going to get revenues from the online retailing. You are going to have to pay employees to staff this online retailing. 150000 for year one, grow at 10% a year for the next three years. And finally, the working capital here is going to be about 10% of revenue. So basically, I can compute the cash flows from this online retail. And for the initial analysis, let's just stay with the traditional capital budgeting. So here's what it's going to look like. Now, oh, before I do that, I do need a discount rate for it. And because it's online retailing, not just the regular retailing, I computed an online retailing beta. By now, this should become rote, which is when I come to the project, rather than use the company's cost of capital, you have to ask, is this project in the same line of business that my company historically has been in? If the answer is yes, you can use the company's cost of capital. But if it's different, you always need to compute a cost of capital that reflects the risk of the project. The cost of capital I ended up with here was much, much higher, 18.12% than the 10.3% that I estimated as a cost of capital for Bookscape based on its old bookstore business. Which makes sense, right? Online retailing is riskier. I should be demanding a higher return. This is now going to become my discount rate. So I took my expected cash flows, one million, my initial investment, adding the change in working capital to it because it's the start of each year, and I compute a net present value of seventy-six thousand three seventy-five. So I'm using the eighteen point one two percent cost cost of capital to discount the cash flows. Looks like a good project, right? if I think of it as a standalone project. But here's what I forgot to tell you along the way. It turns out that if I decide to start this online retail business, the person who manages my store, who I like, is gonna to come to me and say, you know what, you pay me 100,000 as a salary, this is an added requirement in my time. No, you got You have to increase that salary to 120,000. It's all about incremental. Because of this project, you're gonna pay 20,000 more in salary. 
It also turns out that, and after the fourth year, and this is going to be quite a tough trick to pull off. You're going to go to the manager. There's no more online retail. Your store. So I don't know how you pull that off, but let's say you can, because otherwise it's a perpetual twenty thousand dollar increase. Okay. And they'll also use an office that you have. You know, right now you store your records there as the place they're going to run the online retail. You say, what do I do all the records? You're going to move them off, uh, um, uh, off, you know, off, off site somewhere and pay $1,000 a year to store them. So this project has a net present value of 76,000, but it creates two costs, a $20,000 higher salary every year for the next four years and a $1,000 additional storage costs. Now remember those are pre-tax, right? So after taxes and all cash flows will always be after taxes. When you pay 20,000 more to your manager and you have a 40% tax rate, in effect, you're paying $12,000 more because that 20,000 is tax deductible. You're gonna save 40% in taxes. The present value at, you know, of the 12,000 more per year at the 18.12% cost of capital. And here we can debate, should I use the 18.12%, stay with the 10.3, use a weighted average. No, but this 20,000 seems directly attributable to the online store. I take the present value of those. And then I also take the present value of $1,000 each year after taxes. So it'll be 600 a year for the next four years. Effectively, I'm trying to bring in those extra side costs in and the net present value I have is still positive. Heave a sigh of relief. It's still it's lower than it was because I brought in the side costs. But you can see there are projects that can look good on a standalone basis. But once you start bringing in those side costs in, they can tip the scales into a negative net present value. Incidentally, in this case, I could have moved the costs into my traditional cash flows, which is what many of you did for your side costs and benefits. You move them into your full cash flow table. It works as long as you can get away using the same cost of capital. So in this case, because I'm using the 18.12% for both, it becomes you know, essentially the same NPV because I'm doing exactly the same thing. So the nice thing about NPV is you can take each line of the cash flows, discount it separately, add them all up at the end, you'll get exactly the same answer as doing a, an aggregated cash flow and discounting it once at the end. Talk about excess capacity in general. I mean, you had to run into this in this project. But when you think about you know, excess capacity, it's something that companies around the world run into. It could be excess capacity on a factory if you're a manufacturing company. It could be excess capacity on a computer if you're a, if you're a data company or a software company. Excess capacity is something that you think about as a company. Why does excess capacity exist? Because often economies of scale require that you invest on a scale far higher than what you can use today. So you can see how excess capacity comes into being. But once excess capacity comes into being, there's an insidious side effect that comes in, which is we have a storage space, which we're only using halfway. We have this new project that requires storage space. So we have excess capacity, let's use it. It's there already and it's free. You can't sell it because it's a storage capacity. So the argument often with excess capacity is I can't rent it out. I can't sell it. So what is the damage in using that on a new project and acting like it's costless? So let's say I make that argument and you are the CFO. You're the person making a decision on whether you can let the argument go through. What is, what's some of the pushback or the checks you're going to run to see if you can attach a zero cost excess capacity? Or put, put simply, what are the conditions under which excess capacity is truly free? Yes. And, or the existing product is not growing. So first you're asking me, you know, how much is your existing product service using the capacity? How much is it growing? If you have a fast growing existing data service and it's using more of the capacity by using this capacity, I'm going to run out of the capacity earlier. Or if there are new products I can use, that's a trickier one because they're not out there yet. You know? But the first one in particular, I want to make sure that I'm not stepping on the toes of an existing product that might need the capacity. But let's play it through. Let's assume that there is an existing product growing. And by using the new, by using the excess capacity for the new product, you're going to run out of capacity earlier rather than later, right? In the case, I remove the choice from you, but when you run out of capacity earlier rather than later, there are two things you can do. 
One is you can cut back on the production of your less profitable products. So if you have two products, are using it. So in this case, you could have looked at, you no, know, if I'm running out of capacity, should I cut back on the retail use of this or the clinic's use based on margins and profitability? Or you can build new capacity. If you build new capacity, the effect of building new capacities is the present value building earlier rather than later, of investing earlier rather than later. Yes, you will change, I mean, you could change the depreciation rate, but again, it's an account, it, it only so much you can do. The IRS kind of constrains you. One reason I actually forced you into fixed depreciation schedules is we, in the 1980s, you could pick a depreciation schedule. And if you could, you'd have picked an accelerated depreciation schedule for the Costco clinics, you'd have got a much higher net present value. So unfortunately, that choice is no longer in your hand. It's been taken away by, by tax law changes. One final example of side costs, you know, as some of you know, you know, Apple every year comes out with these these big announcement dates. It's, I think a new one is coming out, new iPad Pro. There's all these rumors floating around. You know, supposedly, the new iPad Pro is going to have a better display. You think this is good, right? But when that new iPad Pro comes out and you project out revenues on that new iPad Pro, what do you have to factor in as Apple? That people buying this iPad Pro are not just first-time buyers, they're people who might have bought the old iPad Pro. Product cannibalization. I still remember the first time Starbucks, um, I've been here long enough to have seen multiple Starbucks open and close. But that Starbucks on Broadway opened. There was a Starbucks four blocks away. And I remember going in and saying, how does Starbucks compute the cash flows on a new store, right? I mean, think about it. You're saying that's easy. You'll take what you invest in the store. You look at the expected revenues and cash flows you get from people coming in and buying venti cappuccinos and lattes and frappuccinos or whatever else. But what are you missing when you do that? You're a store four blocks away, right? Now, there are people for whom the store might be more convenient, but those people who have, at least some of those people who have bought. This is, I think, one of the things that Starbucks missed for almost a decade as they kept opening new stores. So each store would look great on a standalone basis, but in the in the aggregate, when you looked across 110 stores, at one point, I think they had 110 stores in New York City, the collective revenues of these stores never matched up to the revenues they had in individual stores because of product cannibalization. It makes a big difference though, because it affects what you use as incremental. Right? Let's go back to the Disney theme park, being built in Rio, right? Now, when you build in Rio, you're going to draw a lot of tourists from Latin America, especially from Brazil. And I've counted that as part of my revenues and my cash flows. But let's play a game. Let's suppose this theme park never opens. Would those theme park visitors have gone elsewhere? At least some of them. If you've been to Orlando, a lot of your, your people in front of you in line in Orlando are Latin American tourists because it's sometimes cheaper to fly from Sao Paulo to Miami than it is to fly within Latin America. What if 20% of the revenues in the Rio Disney theme park came from people who would have come to a U.S. Disney theme park anywhere? Do you see the question I'm asking you, right? Because if you say that 20% will come anyway, when I did my net present value for the Disney theme park, rather than use the total revenues, I should have used only 80% and play it through. If I use only 80% of the revenues, guess what's going to happen to my net present value? It's going to be much lower. In fact, it will have turned negative. When you bring in product cannibalization fully, it'll make you less likely to innovate, to add things. When can you get away with it? Why can why can Disney get away with it when if they're bringing... What's your worst case scenario? You don't build the Rio Disney theme park, right? Your worst case scenario is Universal builds a theme park in Rio. Because remember, these tourists were coming to the Rio Disney because it was more convenient and they decided to go to Universal instead. With Disney, I don't think that's much of a worry because this is not an easily substitute. Can you imagine telling your five-year-old we're going to go see Mickey and then doing a switcheroo and saying, you know what, we're going to a theme park, there will not be a mouse, you know, but there will be other guys there. It doesn't quite fly. 
with Disney's theme parks, you can see why they're going to say, look, it doesn't matter that I'm going to do. So I'm going to count only 80% because if I don't build a theme park, they're going to come anyway too. But if your product is more substitutable, you have to be careful rejecting new projects because you're, it's better to cannibalize yourself than to have a competitor cannibalize you. Now, I, I've owned a MacBook, um, uh, some version of an Apple since 1981. And what pisses me off about, about Apple is how late they are to change. The MacBook Pro looks very much like it did in 2016. In terms of you know they might have increased M1 to the M2 to the M3, but it's you know then then you you don't have a touch screen. In contrast, we look at an HP or a Dell, you know you're constantly innovating. Do you see what we just said? You know, why that might explain it? The way Apple sees it is where are you going to go. The only thing you know is the Apple operating system. If I gave you a Windows computer, you wouldn't even know what keys to hit to get started, or maybe even how to start it. I'm stuck, and they know it. But a Dell or an HP, you can't afford that, right? Because computers are interchangeable, and if you don't upgrade, Lenovo does. They're going to get the market. It actually has very big innovation, very big implications in the healthcare business. And, and here's why. You know, in the healthcare business, you get a patent for a drug, you and only you can provide. So let's say you are the dominant drug maker for ulcers. You control 90% of the market share. Your R&D has come up with a better drug to treat ulcers. If you're the dominant and there's nobody on the horizon, guess what you're going to do? You're going to take longer to develop it because from a cash flow perspective, it's the, it's the differential cash flow that will drive what should I go in. So when you look at businesses and you look at their competitiveness, you can also tie it to innovation and new changes coming in because it's going to play out internally within those companies when they think about what are the cash flows we should be looking at when we decide whether to invest in something. So any questions about, so within Disney, you can see different businesses. The theme park business probably feels pretty secure. The broadcasting streaming business, much messier, right? Because you constantly worry about, will Netflix do something like this, take people away from us? The advantage of having the Avengers and the uh, shows is that not in, easily interchangeable. Yeah. What you're saying is, so it's clear that with theme parks, you would do it regardless because universal theme and you don't want that anything like that. No, no, wait, it's actually the reverse. With the theme park business, because you don't feel universal can come in and do it, you will actually not, you will be slower in building the next theme park because you said people will fly to Orlando anyway. And since I'm going to get 30% of this, but in the broadcasting business, they're far more likely to look at total revenues, even if a portion of that comes from one of their existing shows, right? So the, the more competition there is, the more likely it is that you'll go with total revenues. The less competition is, the, the more likely it is that you'll cut those revenues back to reflect the cannibalization. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So Apple, when it does its incremental cash flows in the next MacBook Pro, there's the cash flows looks at only the incremental revenues because their view is these people keep buying that eight year old MacBook Pro because they have no choice. HP can't do that. They always have to. So it's a much more different from a business perspective. Apple's business is a much better business to have than HP or Dell's, where you constantly have to innovate, cannibalize yourself because you have no choice. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you. I mean, I see things and they say, why isn't this on the Mac yet? No. And you can go back over the last 40 years by having an operating system that locks you in. No. And that's why when Gil Emilio in the mid-90s did something incredibly stupid. Do you remember what he did at Apple? He was a guy who came from Pepsi, right? Which is a mistake to begin with. Yeah. He actually started, you know, for a brief period, he actually leased out the operating, the Mac operating system to other manufacturers. Yeah. And then Steve Jobs came and the first thing he did was no more. They were not doing that, right? 
because it's given Apple the capacity to do. You can actually argue that that if you look at an Apple operating, you know, an Apple's uh, the, the iPhone, as opposed to the Androids. Androids actually innovate more. They new new features show up quicker because they have to be looking over their shoulders at the other manufacturers producing competitors. Apple doesn't have to look at, over its shoulder at anybody, right? So you're going to see innovation hit slower and you see that with the iPhone. You see yourself waiting for things that, that the Android has already, but it's the nature of feeling more secure in your competitive position. Let's at least start thinking about side benefits, project synergies. And Disney is a master at extracting every last dollar, at least in the movie business. Okay. If you think about, you know, the traditional movies, not only did they have the movie and the TV shows and the merchandising, but they also, if, you, if you've gone on Broadway, at least what, four theaters are showing Disney shows. Disney owns two of those theaters. It's become another outlet, side benefits. So the question is, when you look at a new, new Disney project, how do you bring these side benefits in? Not should you, because clearly you knew. How do you bring these side benefits in? Because clearly those side benefits, and you can call them synergies for the rest of the company. I don't know what word you use, but clearly side benefits for the rest of the company. So let's take a very simple example. Let's take the, you know, the Bookscape bookstore and let's think about adding a cafe to the bookstore. Why? Because Borders down the street has a cafe. And if you don't have a cafe, nobody wants to come in right? without the coffee. They can't read a book, I guess. No. So you come up with the, you do the cash flows on the cafe as a standalone business. So let's say you do it like you do it in initial investment cash flows and you come up with a negative net present value. End of the game, right? Negative net present value, let's stop. But let's say building that cafe with the negative net present value will draw in new customers into the bookstore. So you're projected out the increased revenues and the cash flows. I've taken the present value of those cash flows at the bookstore cost to capital. Okay. And I end up with a net present value of 135000 from the additional sales in the bookstore. My cafe standing alone has a negative net present value, but the additional benefits. Now, this wasn't the case with the Costco example, but I could have actually structured the example where the net present value of the clinics was negative, but they created enough side benefits from increased subscriptions. So I could have made this all about side benefits, about increased subscriptions and more sales in the store. And you could have ended up with cash flows from the side benefits actually overwhelming the negative net present value. But the one thing you cannot do is have a negative net present value. Tell me there are side benefits. Refuse to put numbers in the side benefits and insist that I take the investment and use the word strategic to get by. I'm not gonna let you do that. And this is my problem with the word strategic. It's become a lazy way of not thinking through. This is a strategic benefit, right? By building the cafe, I'm drawing a note, but I'm forcing you to be explicit about the benefits. The fact that you're uncertain is no de defense. You can still make your best estimates and make your best judgments. Right? So when you look at synergies, that's basically, and let me complete the story by going back to the harm and audio. Remember, we came up with the value for the for the company of 2.5 billion. The market value is 5.4. And I said, why would you want to do that? But then you threw in the word synergy. Let's assume you decide that by combining the two companies, you can create synergies. The definition of synergy is it by combining two businesses, you're able to do something you couldn't have done as standalone. So who do the cash flows accrue to? The combined company. When we talked about discount rates reflecting the risk of the cash flows, if I have synergies accruing to just one company, then I can use the cost of capital of that company. If I have synergies accruing to both companies, I have to use a weighted average cost of capital. In this case, let's assume the synergies accrue almost entirely to Tata Motors. They're going to put Harman audios in the cars. You come up with expected cash flows of 10 billion more and after tax operating income starting in year four growing at 4% a year in perpetuity. So basically it'll take about three years to integrate these audios into your cars. You can take the present value of that synergy using the cost of equity here in rupee terms. 
Why? Because these are benefits that accrue to Tata Motors. They're all, the risk I'm going to use is the risk in the automobile business because that's where the sales are coming from. And I take a present value of that synergy reflecting the risk of the cash flows. So side costs, side benefits are all around you. And what I hope you will be able to do is the next time you are actually at a decision meeting where somebody says, this doesn't look good based on the numbers, but there's other good stuff that comes with it. Force them. It'll actually make them better and you better because it's truly good stuff. Making it explicit makes it more likely to happen. You know that in actual, in actual mergers, 83% of mergers, no synergy shows up. These are mergers with synergies. And one reason is people don't plan for it. They don't make it explicit. If you don't make it explicit, how do you hold people accountable? It doesn't happen magically. So this is something that will actually make strategy better because it will force strategic thinking to become more grounded in reality. So after the quiz on Monday, so we will have class on Monday, we're going to complete packet one. So you know, if you have the time, download packet two, because starting on Wednesday, we will be into financing, mixed financing choices. But I will see you on Monday. Uh, the, um, they have an interesting arrangement with Bull Life Intel. They give Intel shares to the employees. And basically, Intel is just increasing their trading capital. 